Hello, and welcome to the video for the Unreal Engine Too Long Didn't Read Highlights for version 4.21 release notes. We've had over 120 contributions to the source code from the community, as well as the normal changes and bug fixes. We're going to cover a few of those now. Niagara, we now have GPU-only texture sampling, as well as skeletal mesh data interface improvements. The ribbon particle has seen performance improvements, as well as non-mobile platforms now have CPU simulation support. We have direct switch support for Niagara, as well as a few new modules that you can use in your systems. For creating new systems or emitters, we now have a simplified creation dialog. You can use new existing templates, which show good usage of Niagara, as well as use existing systems or emitters to create your new system. We have a new pendulum constraint. It allows us to use physics to constrain the effects. It has optional spring drivers, and it calculates potential energy, as you can see here. There were a bunch of mobile optimizations, thanks to Fortnite. Primarily for Android, we have improved Vulkan support. We have a new config rule system. It allows us to help catch issues very early in the startup process. It allows you to quickly check for device support and provide warnings or errors, such as out-of-date drivers or unsupported GPUs. You have the program Binary Cache. It allows you to improve shader loading performance. It basically makes a cache based on an optimized path, and it allows you to use these programs and optimize binaries to dramatically decrease shader loading times. We have emulated uniform buffers, and we have a CPU thread affinity control. So the CPU thread affinity control, you have mobile devices that have big cores and little cores that are designed to do different things. Using the configural system, we can design setups so that way, for example, if enabled, certain threads such as renders, pools, task graph stats, and async loading can be switched to the little core. That way, primary processing can be on the big cores and you don't have issues with switching back and forth. There's also improved GPU particle simulation performance, and now LOD transitions use the dithering effect. Pixel streaming has been added into early access. It allows you to run the engine in a different machine and stream the viewport directly to a web browser. You get the highest rendering quality with zero download and zero install, as you can see from the picture here. It also allows interactivity by sending keyboard, mouse, and touch events back to the engine running remotely. The animation system has seen a few updates. So we have some compression updates. The frame weight for the animation sequence is now shown in the viewport. And as you can see from the video here, the animation notify system has improvements. You can now add in extra animation notifies, such as when this character is running, the animation for the cloak now stops at the appropriate points rather than continuing on. We have caching and auto complaint for sync marker names. Local space is now defined as the default coordinate space for animation editors instead of world. And then the CCDIK skeletal control node has been added. CCDIK stands for Cyclic Coordinate Descent Inverse Connect Kinematics. Basically, it allows you to do things such as having a finger touch an actual item with physics and push it in using the appropriate skeletal systems from like the shoulder down to the fingertip itself. The professional video I.O. system has seen some improvements. There are now media profiles for easily swapping between devices and machines using proxy media sources outputs. There's a time code provider panel now. It supports 10-bit audio input and output. And there's now a new plugin for Blackmagic devices. Rather than the plugin, which used to be for the AJA only device being in the system, they've now been moved to the marketplace. So you can find the AJA and Blackmagic plugins on the marketplace. There's a new plugin for geographically accurate sun positioning. It's in early access, and as you can see here, it gives us access to the ability to set the latitude, longitude, and time zone, year, month, and day, and even down to the hour, minute, and second, and it gives you a geographically accurate sun, which is pretty nice if you need to do either something for real world visualization, or you want a nice dramatic time of day system inside of your project. We have new updated static mesh processing. As you can see here in the picture, you can now remove unnecessary UV mappings from your static mesh. 
You can use Python and Blueprint scripts to create planar, box, and cylindrical projection mappings. There's a proxy geometry tool for merging and simplifying groups of stack meshes now. And you have the ability to reuse level of detail from one stack mesh to another. There's been a few Blueprint usability improvements. Quick jump navigation shortcuts. If you ever played a real-time strategy game such as StarCraft or WarCraft, you have the ability to quick group things. Control 1, Control 2 to set a group, and then Shift 1 and 2 to go back to those groups. Well, you can now do that inside of your viewport to quickly jump between points inside of blueprints. And it will remember that between different blueprints. It is all kept locally on your machine, so you don't have to worry about messing up with other people's settings. You can now right-click on a sequence node and insert a target output before or after instead of just adding a pin at the bottom of your list. And you can reduce the executable file size by excluding the monolithic engine header files from nativized BP code. Physical lighting has gone through a few updates. It now displays the unit type next to the intensity. So no longer we have to guess what type of intensity it uses, it will tell you in the intensity slider. Directional lights are now displayed in Lux. Skylights is now CD over M2. Post-process auto exposure supports EV100 for extended ranges of luminance. The pixel inspector can now display pre-exposure for seeing colors. And the HDR visualization now has a picture-in-picture -picture for instant feedback and is expressed in EV100. The sound system has a few changes. We have a submix envelope follower. We have a filter sound submix effect. The sound submix effect reverb dry level and then there's been some actual optimizations to the source effects API. Sequencer. We now have a sequencer event track refactorization, which you can see in the video here, as well as the experimental support that allows playback of a geometry cache from Alembic imports in a sequencer as a playback track. There's experimental support for baking down the audio in a master audio submix. So now you're able to export out the audio with your sequencer and then sequencer guide marks to allow you snapping or identifying key ports in your timeline. Linux now has Vulkan as the default renderer. The media player supports WebM in VPX 8 and 9 format. And the crash reporter GUI now works on Linux. So if you have a crash, feel free to report it so that way it can get fixed in an easy manner. A few other smaller changes. The cooker has been improved by about 60%. So we have now better improved cooker performance. The replication graph is now out of experimental. We have the gauntlet automation framework, which is an early access. It allows you to automate the process of deploying builds to devices, running one or more clients or servers, and then processing the result. The gauntlet test is a C-sharp script that expresses a simple configuration for your test, such as how many clients, servers, and what parameters you want to test. HTML5 now uses an HTML, JS, and CSS file rather than one monolithic HTML file for easily customizing and templating. The IP4 and 6 support has been merged into one socket subsystem rather than separate. There's DDoS detection and mitigation support in the networking system. And the physics interface has been updated with a very large C++ code refactor and the API has been changed. So if you're using physics in C++, you definitely need to check out the documentation for that. A few other small ones is a pipeline state object caching. There's now full Windows Mixed Reality support, along with complete Magic Leap support if you're a developer. Oculus avatars are now supported. And round robin occlusion is used for VR for better performance. Along with that, we have our normal platform SDK upgrades, PS4, Xbox One, Visual Studio. They've all been upgraded to the latest versions as of this release so that we have better compatibility and support. That's just a quick highlight. The full release notes can be found here. Other than that, have fun and enjoy the new release.